The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would be with us now. Be with us in your Word, be with your people, for this is your church. These are your people, this is your Word. May it be proclaimed in such a way that it honors you. May your spirit be present. May you use me. May I be humble. May I speak as you direct. And may you be honored this morning. I pray that you'd wash away the busyness of the week and the celebration of the holidays and what would be left would be you and our desire our desire to grow and to know you. Lord Jesus, be with us now. It's your name we pray. Amen. So one day, a pastor sat in one of the children's Sunday school classes. With a bit of a sly impudence, he asked, Who broke down the walls of Jericho? I didn't, Mr. Honest, a startled boy blurted. Observing the minister's chagrin, the teacher said, this boy is honest, I can vouch for him. Observing the, uh, later the pastor recounted the experience to an elder, and the elder replied, hmm, sounds incriminating. But I've known the boy and the teacher for a long time, and I'm sure neither one is guilty. Appalled, the pastor took the matter up with the deacon board. The chairman of the board said, why make a mountain out of a molehill? Let's have the walls repaired and charge it to the upkeep. Ignorance. Ignorance. Ignorance isn't always bliss, is it? And as we step away from 2018 into 2019, the body of Christ need not be ignorant of what it's facing. Because for 2,000 years, it's been threatened by apostasy, not only from without, but from within. And the author of the book that we're going to step into today, it's the book of Jude, had exactly this in mind when he penned the letter to the church just about 2,000 years ago. Not only did he want us to know what the body of Christ was facing, but also how to rightly address it. So please turn in your Bibles to the book of Jude. This is the penultimate, that means next to last, penultimate book of the Bible, book of Jude. And this morning we're going to focus on verses 20 through 25. But in order to get there, we kind of need to set the context, and I want us to know a little bit about the author. I want us to know the main thrust of his letter. And to do that, we're just going to review a few of the verses ahead of that. So starting in verse 1, it says, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. And here's the significance of this. Who's this Jude? Well, Jude could be Jude, Judah, Judas. Those are all kind of synonymous you got Hebrew pronunciations and, and all of that. And so if you look in Matthew 13, 55, you'll find this, of people speaking of Christ in his own hometown, he said, and they say, of the, they say of Christ this, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? you find a similar reference in Mark 6, 3. And then in Galatians 1, 9, you'll find the reference to James having spoken with Paul. And James, the, the uh, brother of Christ, earthly brother of Christ, was the leader of the church. And so Jude identifies himself with James in a brotherly fashion. But what he doesn't do is identify himself with Jesus in a brotherly fashion. Because in John 7, 5, we find that his brothers, Christ's brothers, did not believe in him. And we find the miraculous work that Christ does 
in James's life, as he comes to Christ, Christ appears to him. You can find this in 1 Corinthians 15. Christ appears to him as, as the resurrected Christ, and he believes. We don't get a timeline for Jude. For all we know, Jude still rejected him. And much later, Jude came to him. For all we know. But here we sit with a letter from a man who was a brother, an earthly brother of Jesus Christ, and what does he identify himself as? A bond servant. A bond servant. The due loss. And later on in 4, when he's making reference to Christ again, he says, denying our Master and Lord Jesus Christ. He identifies himself as the due loss. He identifies Christ as the despotos, my master. Not my brother, my master. A different viewpoint. I want us to see the heart of this author, of this letter. So what is he saying? What does he want to write? What's his point? What's the drive? Look with me, if you would, in verse 3. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I really, 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 really wanted to write about this, but it just wasn't happening. I felt the necessity to write to you, appealing to you, to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all handed down to the saints. So he parakaleo, pleading, please, I'm appealing to you, please. And he abba, a, apa, a, apoganizo mai. He hyper, epi, hyper apologizes, hyper, please fight, hyper fight, fight hard for what? The faith. Why? Why do we need to fight? And so when we, when we pose that question, why, and then it's who, and then it's how, right? That would be it. So why do we need to fight? Verse 4, for certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. This is why. Why? Apostates have snuck in. And they're good because they look like everybody else. And the message sounds very similar to everybody else. They're unnoticed. That's why. Who? Who? Who was he talking about? That's verses 5 all the way through verse 19. This is, it describes them. Boom, boom, boom. I'm not going to spend any time really in this. I'm going to give you just a couple of characteristics. Ken, in about a month or so, is going to step into the book of 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 2 and Jude, as far as talking about apostates, are pretty much side by side. The only difference is Peter is saying, the apostates are coming, the apostates are coming. And then Jude says, they're here. Okay, that's, that's pretty much the only difference. But as far as describing who these people are, 2 Peter chapter 2. So show up for that if you want to get the the lowdown on them. So, I, I want us to, though, look at characteristics. Verse 16, jump to verse 16. It says they're grumblers. It says they're fault finders. It says they, they're of their own desires. It says they're arrogant speakers. It says they flatter people to gain an advantage, to get up on them. And then verse 19, it says, they cause divisions. They think like the world. And the Spirit of God isn't in them. Those are some pretty serious charges. But what I want us to think about with regard to those things is not to have your mind drift and say, I wonder who 
And Southside Bible Church is like that. I want your mind to settle on yourself and evaluate, am I like that? Because if I'm like that, then maybe I'm just the baby seed of something starting. And that's something to go to God in. Let's have the humility to look at ourselves and say, am I this? So that brings us then to verse 20. Okay, so, so we have found, why are we fighting? Who are we fighting now? How do we fight? Look with me at verses 20 and 21. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Does that strike you as odd? Wouldn't you expect more of a charge of identify these guys and get them out? Get rid of them. Mark them and get rid of them. If you look at Revelation 2, verses 1 through 3, we read about the church of Ephesus. It says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this, I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance, that you cannot tolerate evil men. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not. And you found them to be false, and you have... You have have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. Jump to verse 6. Yet this you you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Sounds like good stuff. Good job. You can call out those apostates. Good job. But look at verses 4 and 5. But I have this against you, that you've left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I'm coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. You're not going to be a church anymore. That's a, that's a warning right there. So apost, a dealing with apostates and apostasy isn't just about pointing the finger and saying, apostate, get lost. A matter of fact, that can be dangerous if not balanced with why we're doing it in the first place. After all, who is being offended? And all too often we make it about ourselves. They're wrong and I'm right. No, what makes them wrong is they're violating the truth of God. That's what makes them wrong. And so what we need to do instead is to to rest in Christ. What we need to do is understand who this Christ is. And so that's what we're seeing here. We need to rest and remain here in who Christ is. And that's a charge to every believer to remain in Christ. So what does that look like? That's what's being described here. So let's step into the verse, verse 20. But you, okay, Ken likes his but nows. This is a but you, differentiating from them, they. You see that all throughout the passage here. Verse 8, these men. Verse 10, these men. Verse 11, woe to them. Verse 12, these are the men. Verse 14, these are the men. These, 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 them, them, them. Now he says, but you, but you, you're different. And he calls them beloved. Beloved. Agapatoi, toyos. Beloved, my dear believing followers of Christ. My beloved. What, what does he want us to do? Building yourselves up on your most holy faith. 
So this word, building, it's used six different times in the New Testament. Um, for those of you taking notes, Ephesians 2, 6, Colossians 2, 7 would be two of those references. And it's always talking about starting with a foundation and then building on that foundation. Well, he tells us what the foundation is, your most holy faith. Well, this is a faith that differentiate from just a, a faith. You can have faith in anything. You can put your faith in anything. And I'm going to venture a guess that there are people sitting here today that have their faith in something else. This is most holy, your most holy faith. Well, this set apart, this different faith is the faith of a true believer, a person placing their faith and trust in nothing but Christ and Him alone. And so what are they to do? They are to build up. Build up. Building yourselves up on your most holy faith. Well, well what are we supposed to do? How, how is this building supposed to happen? Well, look at Acts 20, 32. I now commend you to God... This is Paul's charge to the churches. I now commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So how are we to build ourselves up on our most holy faith? By the word of God. By the word of God. That's how we are to build ourselves up on our most holy faith. So that's number one. Number two, he says, praying in the Holy Spirit. And I know someone out there is going, "Uh uh-oh, what's this about? Well, whenever you want to find out what something is, one of the first things that can be very helpful is identifying what it is not. It is not praying in tongues, as some have identified. How do I know this? Because this is a charge to all believers. The gift of tongues is not to all believers. I can go into many other aspects, but that right there should disqualify it. That's not what it's about. What it is not, it's not a formula. All a prayer of Jabez type of stuff. Just put it in, turn the crank, God answers your prayer. That's not what praying in the Spirit is. And it can't just merely be determined by its outcome. Meaning, if my prayer was answered, that was praying in the Spirit. If my prayer was not answered, then that was not praying in the Spirit. That is not true. So that's what it's not. So what is it? So I'm going to take you to grammar school for a little bit. This praying is in what is called the middle passive voice. Stay with me, okay? The middle voice, maybe you're familiar with the active voice. Let's start there. The active voice means I am doing an action on someone or something. The middle voice says I am acting alone. I'm the only one acting. The passive voice means I am being acted upon. So I want to take a guess what the middle passive voice is. Putting those two together, it's both. I am acting alone, and I'm being acted upon. I think this is true of praying in the Spirit. In a very real way, I am acting alone. I go to God. But I am being acted upon in His Spirit, in the Holy Spirit. So what does this mean? What does it mean? What does it look like? Well, I think we've got kind of glimpses of what it really does look like in Scripture. If you look at Romans 9, 1 through 4, Paul is, is praying, is pleading. He's pleading his heart out. And there's something subtle in here that I don't want us to blow by. I want us to pick up on. It says, I'm telling the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience testifies with me. And here's, here's the phrase I want you to pick up on, in the Holy Spirit, that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were a curse separate from Christ.
for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh who are Israelites, to whom belong the adoption of sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises. What's he saying? He says, I'm honestly praying that the Jews would come to know Christ as I do. And if it means that I am damned, so be it. That is a harsh, that's a harsh statement. I don't think many people could say that of their salvation. I'm willing to give up my own, my salvation for this people. That is huge. And here's the thing. He says, I'm genuine about this. And what he draws in, what he brings in is he brings in the Holy Spirit. He says, my conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit. So I think very much a part of praying in the Spirit is genuineness. All too often we approach God and approach His throne, and it's not real. It's not genuine. It's flowery. It's some guff. It's some rehearsed something. It's not the way we are to approach God. If your heart is sorrowful, approach Him in your sorrow. If it's joyful, approach Him in your joy. If you're struggling, approach Him in your struggle. Approach Him where you're at. Approach Him genuinely. That's very much a part of praying in the Spirit. Romans 8, 26 and 27. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And He who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because He intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Praying in the Spirit is being humble, is being weak. It's saying it's not about me, it's about God's glory. It's being desperate. It's being desperate. A couple of your elders and I went on a scuba diving trip where we decided we'd plumb the depths of the murky oceans of Texas and uh, check out the Texas Clipper and... uh, We got down over 100 feet, down there with our tanks. And I remember uh, Brian Rutland, he was one of the poor saps that went with us, saying, uh, as we were down there, he said, I wanted to know where you guys were at all times because as I took every gasp of air from that tank, I needed it. And you see, if you find yourself down there 100 feet without your air, you're in big trouble. And you want a buddy quick. And that's the way we should be approaching the prayer in the Spirit. I desperately need you like I need air. And all too often, we approach in arrogance, in in condescension, just in ourselves. And Jude's begging with us, Don't approach him that way. Approach him in the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit. And then verse 21, he says, Keep yourselves in the love of God. And every Calvinist died a little bit inside. This is a charge. This is a charge to every believer to keep yourselves in the love of God. And here's the thing. It's an aorist tense, and it tells us a little bit about why it's kind of structured this way. Notice it doesn't say in English, keeping. It says keep. And the reason why is because it's kind of stacking something. And what it's telling us is that we need to build ourselves up on our most holy faith and pray in the Spirit. And then then we'll be pursuing to keep ourselves in the love of God. Meaning those two things we're we're dependent upon. You can't do this, you can't keep yourself in the love of God without these other two things. If you're not building your faith, if you're not praying, there's no way you're going to be loving either. So if you think, Boy, my love is dry. I want you to ask yourself, what's your prayer life like? What's your time in the Word like? If it's non-existent, I think we have the answer. 
I think Jude's given us the answer. Keep yourselves in the love of God. John 15, 9 through 12 says, Just as the Father has loved me, I also love you, loved you. Abide in my love. Sounds very familiar. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. This is my commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. He wants us to obey him. It's a part of keeping ourselves in the love of God. 1 John 5, 3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And what? His commandments aren't burdensome. Why not? Why aren't they burdensome? Because I love him. And so thus we, we obey because we love. We don't, we don't obey to get his love. Very different. So we'll keep ourselves in the love of God. And so, yeah, this is a perfect passage that fleshes out that the Bible teaches that God is completely sovereign and man is also responsible. Well, how do I get that? Look back at Jude 1, 1. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and, and it's the same Greek word, kept for Jesus Christ. Who's doing the keeping there? God is. God's keeping. Then, then how is it that we're being called to keep? Which is right? Does he keep me or do I keep me? Yes. He does. Let me clarify something for you. If you are keeping yourself in the love of God, it's indicative that God is keeping you. One is very much associated with the other. Rest in that. And we'll get to that as we close. So keep yourselves in the love of God. And then what? 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. What does this do? What does this, this building ourselves on our most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keeping ourselves in the love of God, what does it do? It makes us long for the return of Christ because that's where the mercy of God's going to be revealed because what we deserve, when he comes the second time, he's not coming as the humble servant. He's coming as the conquering king to mete out justice. And sinners... Justice is met out by punishment and judgment unless, unless there's mercy. And to the believer, mercy is shown because of the cross of Christ. Because of Christ's finished work on the cross, the believer is met with mercy. What we deserve is justice. What we get is goodness. What we deserve is to be outcast. What we get is to be embraced as children. My wife, my beloved wife Kim, and I had a long-distance relationship. She was in New York. I was in Louisiana. Yes, she's the smart one. And our engagement was 11 months. Don't do that. It was torture. So as that 11 months drug on and I fell more and more deeply in love with my beloved wife, the more and more I wanted to see her. And it was three plane hops to get there. It was a long day, but it was always worth it. 
So this should be our heart. As we grow in love with Christ, because He is working in and through us, so should our desire to see Him. Titus 2, 13 and 14 says, Looking, same word, prostekomai, for the blessed hope and the appearing of, our, of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave Himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed. Redeem us. And to purify for Himself. Make us pure. A people for His own possession, zealous for good deeds. He changes us completely. He changes us. And that's the overflow of our faith. So that's what Christ does in us. So what else does this do? And I want you to look with me at verses 22 and 23. Look at this. And and have mercy on some who are doubting, Save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. What's he getting at? What's he saying? Well, as we are building, up, being built up in Christ, as we are being built on our most holy faith, as we are praying in the Holy Spirit, as we are being kept in the love of God and keeping ourselves in the love of God, as we are longing to see our Lord and Savior, This should cause something. It should cause us to reach out. It should cause us to reach out to a dying world. It shouldn't cause us to climb into ourselves and say, see how good my faith is. See how strong I am. See how loving I am. See how kind I am. Aren't I great? Instead, it should do the reverse. It should cause us to reach out. And in this context, it's reaching out to an apostatized people. That's first group, it says, and have mercy on some who are, what? Doubting. Why? Because these apostates, what is it causing them to do? Doubt the very faith that they're in. That's what it's causing them to do. And what are we to, ha- what are we to do? What are we to have? Mercy. Where did you just see that? You saw it in the previous verse. We are shown mercy. And so if you've missed something, if, if you are shown mercy and you will not show mercy, you will not be shown mercy. Cross-reference Matthew 18 in the parable of the slave. You want mercy, show mercy. And what are we supposed to do? Have mercy on some. Help them with the doubting. uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says we need to admonish the unruly. Might be what needs to be done here. Next group of people. It says save others, snatching them out of the fire. This isn't calling on us to be the Savior. That's Christ. But what does Jesus use as a means? He uses us, he uses his word, and he uses his people to bring his word to a people that needs it. So this other group, it says, save others, snatching them out of the fire. James 5, 19 through 20 might help you, help us understand a little bit better about what we're talking about here. It says, my brethren, if any among you strays from the truth... And one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Where is he heading? Where is this person heading if you're snatching them out of a fire? They're heading towards spiritual death, spiritual damnation. So they're just, they're a little bit beyond just doubting. They've bought into it. They bought into the lie. And all too often, those of us who are in the truth want to say, I know the truth, and so I want nothing to do with you. And in a way, we're wishing them hell, when instead we should be wishing and begging for them to come to know this Christ. So 
It says, snatching them out of a fire. This is like a fireman's carry. This is to grab by the collar and pull. That's what the phrase is. You're desperate. Get out of there! You're going to die! Should change your heart. Then we got this last group. And on some have mercy with fear. So this is different than this first group. Hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. So what's going on here? Um, The Greek is pretty graphic here and what's being described. Uh, it's, It's basically saying hating underwear. And for those of you who have small children and you find a pair of dirty underwear over in a corner, how do you pick that up? For me personally, it's, it's by the smallest possible touch. And you get it to where it needs to go, right? That's what's being described here. Who are we dealing with? We're actually dealing with the apostates themselves. And it's saying, have mercy on some. If you're given the opportunity, granted, be in verse 20 and 21 first. Don't go talking to an apostate without being firmly in verses 20 and 21. But if you, some of us will get the opportunity. And it's saying, instead of running the other way, have mercy with fear, phobos, phobia, great fear, okay? You, you got to understand who it is that you're dealing with here. And you got to be very, very careful about how you do it. That's what's being described. But you were shown mercy. Show mercy. If you're given the opportunity, show mercy by proclaiming the gospel. Revelation 3, 1 through 4 speaks of the church of Sardis. It says, He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain which were about to die, for I have not found your deeds completed, uh, completed in the sight of God. So, so remember, you have received what you have received and heard, and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. But, here's where we're getting, we get this parallel. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled, same thought there, their garments. There it is. And they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So how do you soil your garments? Apostasy. That's what he was describing with the church in Sardis. So remember, folks, James 1.27, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress. And we usually stop there. That's not where the verse stops. It says, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Don't get close enough to get stained. Do preach the gospel. Do have mercy. But the deeper the people are that you're dealing with in apostasy, the more careful you need to be in doing so, lest you are stained yourself. Because folks, believe me, it's, if it were very, very obvious, and it should be if you're steeped in the word, If it were very, very obvious, then no one would buy off on it. But it's got just enough truth and just enough appeal where it's going to sound good. This guy's a nice guy. Not arguing that. He really helps people out. I'm not arguing that either. What we're arguing about is whether or not it's apostasy. And the only way that you're going to recognize that is if you measure it against truth and not what you feel to be right. And the only measure of truth is God's Word. Again, be in verse 20 and 21 
before you step into 22 and 23. So that leaves us with verses 24 and 25. Verse 24 says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you blameless, to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. So are you and I in this alone? No. I hope you see the utter dependency that we need to have on the Spirit and on Christ in our walks and in our outreach. He's able to The the Greek word is the word from which we get our word dynamite. Boom. He's able. He's powerful. He's powerfully able to what? To keep. A slightly different word than uh, uh, verse uh, 1 and verse 21. Fulaso is the the word for keep. And that word is used in 2 Thessalonians 3.3. Listen, listen. But the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. That's our word. 2 Timothy 1.12, For this reason I also suffered these things, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able, again, to guard, that's our word, what I have entrusted to him until that day. He will protect and guard us. And he's able to do it. He's powerful to do it. And what is it that he's going to do? He's going to keep us from stumbling. Stumbling to to fall in such a way that there is no getting back up. He'll keep us. This is the assurance of the believer. But Nate, what about verse 21? It hasn't gone away. It remains there. It's the same. Let's go back to what we said before. He keeps me. And that's why I keep myself. And by keeping myself, it's indicative that he is keeping me. So don't walk out of here and say, he's able to keep me and so I'm just going to live my life however. No, that's just indicative that you're not kept. Because if he's keeping you, you're going to want to be kept and you're going to keep. I hope that's as plain as mud. But it's the truth of the Scripture. So what what else does he do? He keeps us. He keeps us from stumbling. And then what does he do to make us stand in his presence in the presence of his glory, blameless, with great joy. And of course it's going to be great joy. Because what is he doing? We're blameless. We're made blameless. We're sinners. We're filthy, rotten, dirty sinners made blameless. And he's able to do it. He's able to make us stand in his glory. Glory that should just fry us. The minute we step into his presence, and it doesn't, because of his awesome work on the cross, blameless, blameless before God. And I hope, I hope you see that that brings about great joy. Great joy. In Hebrews 1, 8 8 and 9, uh, this is said of Christ, and it uses the same word for great joy here. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness. That's our word. Above your companions. Great joy. We have great, great joy. This kind of joy. Why? Because of the work of of the cross. So that leaves us with verse 
25. And with great reflection comes great doxology. Verse 25. To the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now, and forever. Amen. This is doxology. It's what, where Jude was left after all that he reflected on. This is what it brings him to. Praise to God. And it's, I wish we had more time to just spend baking and basking in all of what is being described here. But to move quickly through it, glory, it's the radiance of God, majesty, the rule of God, dominion, the scope of his kingdom, authority, the right of his rule. All of these things are true of God. And then it's put in the context of eternity past an eternity present, an eternity future. He's described as the eternal God. He has no beginning. He will have no end. He is God and God alone, for there is none that existed before Him. There is none besides Him. He is God, and He is God alone. And Jude, this brother who rejected him, who did not believe in him, says to him, he's God, God our Savior. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's how he saved us. Be glory, be majesty, dominion and authority. You see, this is where it should Park all believers, should bring you to the throne room of God and you just fall to your face and say, thank you for being who you are. And I kneel. And I pray if you don't know this, this God in this way that you will come to him this morning, that you'll kneel before this God. And so as you look out at starting a new year, 2019, I pray that you take this charge in Jude to heart. Take this charge. Build yourself up on your most holy faith. Pray in the Spirit. Keep yourself in the love of God. And look, look with great anxiety, with great anxiousness for His mercy to appear. May it be now. May it be soon. Maranatha. Lord, come quickly. And then may we reach out. May we reach out to others. May the gospel go forth. May Southside Bible Church be a place that reaches out to a dying world with the truth of the gospel because it's true and we are saved by a merciful God. So I close with this. Where is true joy? It's not in unbelief. Voltaire was an infidel of the most pronounced type. He wrote, I wish I had never been born. It's not in pleasure. Lord Byron lived a life of pleasure if anyone did. And he wrote, the worm, the canker, and grief are mine alone. It's not in money. Jay Gould, an American millionaire, had plenty of that. When dying, he said, I suppose I'm the most miserable man on earth. And it's not in position and fame. Lord Beaconsfield enjoyed more than his share of both, and he wrote, Youth is a mistake, manhood a struggle, old age a regret. It's not in military glory. Alexander the Great conquered the known world in his day. Having done so, he wept in his tent because he said there is no, other, no more worlds to conquer. Where then is true joy found? 
The answer is simple. It's in Christ alone. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you are most glorified in all of this, in your word. May you be glorified in your people, even today. May we be found resting wholly and solely in you. And in this new year, as you give us life and breath every day, that we might honor you in it. I pray for those who are here, sitting here today, who haven't yet come to you. Lord, would you save them? Would today be the day of salvation for them, even now? May they see you for all of who you are in your glory, in your mercy, in your majesty. Thank you for giving us Jesus Christ, in whose excellent name we pray. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.